Okay. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, the third lecture in the series of I know outreach uh, lecture series that we have been having uh, from beginning of this week. Uh, today we have uh, Professor Vandana Nanal speaking to you. Uh, she is a professor at TIFR in the Department of Nuclear and Atomic uh, Physics. Uh, she did a PhD in experimental nuclear physics from TIFR itself way back in 1994. And after her postdoctoral work at Oregon National Lab in US, she joined TIFR back as a faculty in 1998. Uh, her major act areas of research are experimental nuclear physics and accelerator physics. Uh, in fact, she has played a major role in development and commissioning of superconducting linear accelerator called LINAC, uh, which is a which is a joint TIFR BRC uh, facility. Uh, and now she is leading the effort to set up an experiment to search for neutrino-less uh, double beta decay in India. And, uh, this particular experiment is going to be co-located along with the so-called ICAL detector in the INO cavern. And today she's going to share with you the exciting R&D that has been going on for quite a few years in developing the uh, detectors and instrumentation. And also, of course, she's going to speak about what the uh, NDBD itself. So with that, uh, let us hand over uh, the forum to Professor Vandana Nama. Thank you, Dr. Satya, for a kind introduction. And good evening to all of you. Uh, welcome to this talk. Uh, it's very nice to get all of you here. Though I can't see you all, but uh, it's like a virtual interaction. So I hope it will go smoothly without any breaks. And in case there are breaks, let's follow the TV principle. Stay tuned. We will be back. Um, I'm going to talk about. Uh, probing neutrinos with cool detectors, and we'll probably explain the things as I go along. I do see some experts joining in the audience, so they just have to sit back and probably add expert comments at the end. This really is meant to talk at a, is meant at a general level more for the people who are not in the field. Um, just another thing is in case on some of the slides, I hope you can see all the slides clearly, and in in some of the slides, you see some technical jargon. Don't worry about it because what I want to say, I can convey without uh, really getting into some of those uh, technicalities. But nonetheless, I have put in something so that you get an idea about the uh, detectors and uh, our laboratory, how things look like and so on. So let's start the story of this very tiny elusive particle called the neutrino. And in the next... Uh, 45 minutes or so, what we are going to do is to take a journey deep into the world of this tiny nuclei and particles and understand what the things look like and what do we know about this tiny world. So what are nuclei? Uh, we know that the uh, materials that matter around us is made of atoms and the nuclei reside at the center of the atom. So this nuclear matter is the matter, nuclei is the matter which makes up stars, planets and living beings, it constitutes more than 99.9% .9 of our visible world. So most of the matter which we see is actually the nuclear matter. The energy the sun radiates, the energy that makes life possible originates in nuclear processes. So if you want to put it in a very short, crisp blurbs, they are the ultimate building blocks of matter and these are the fuel of stars. And how do we learn about nuclei and particles? So this is very well illustrated in this cartoon. It's like a big elephant being pressed by try to understand the elephant by six. You must have heard the story about the elephant and six blind men. So it's like that. And we try to find out different parts of it, different properties of it, and try to reconstruct that what the nucleus really would be like. Because we cannot just take a microscope and look at it or just create an individual nucleus or isolate it and study its properties. And it's not just the nucleus, we want to understand what is inside the nucleus and each of these particles and its constituents, so they get even more tiny. So where did it, it all start? It all started with the discovery of radioactivity at the end of 19th century and for which in 1903, Nobel Prize was awarded to Henry Becquerel, Marie Curie and Pierre Curie. Marie Curie was the first woman to get Nobel uh, uh, Prize, and uh, there have been 
only two Nobel laureates still very, very recently, and I'm woman, uh, two women Nobel laureates still very recently, and I will talk about it in shortly in the later part of the lecture. So even the term radioactivity was coined by Marie Curie and the different radiations which they found, they actually named them just after the uh, Greek alphabet letters as alpha, beta, gamma. And the properties of these uh, uh, radiations were found later. The structure of the atom as such came uh, uh, in uh, later after experiments with uh, Rutherford. And uh, he in that sense can be called father of nuclear physics. Rutherford actually received the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1908. Before that, as shown in this picture, you have a Thomson model, which was thought of like a pudding model that the electron, it was known by then that the new, there are positive charges and negative charges. So it was just considered that these charges like a pudding are distributed uh, throughout the atom. And Rutherford actually through his experiments showed that that's not the case, whereas the, the atom, it is, is more like an apple core and the apple around it. So whereas you have the positive charges lying there at the center of the atom and the electrons surrounding it. So the atoms were made of electrons and nucleus were known, but how they're structured was what came out of Rutherford's experiments. And this is uh, then was called Rutherford model of the atom. This was formulated in 1911. But let us understand now how tiny is this tiny nucleus. The matter, as I told, is an atom. So if the size of the hydrogen atom itself is about a 0.1 nanometer. Now, if we, we know that the wavelengths of the visible light falls in the uh, range of 3,700 angstrom to about 6,000 angstrom, or in other words, 370 to 600 nanometer. And the size of hydrogen matter is uh, one tenth of a nanometer. And now if you consider a nucleus, which is even tinier, which is usually expressed the size expressed as in Fermi's, but to get an idea of the scale, if an atom was of the size of an earth, nucleus would be size of a cricket stadium. So it is that tiny in an earth. But as I told you, the whole mass of the thing is concentrated at this, uh, in the nucleus. So these are really heavyweight candidates. So here I show you a cartoon picture of like a gold atom, I mean, sorry, gold coin. And this is a 10 gram gold coin. So typically the density of the gold is like a 20 gram per centimeter cube. And density of nuclear matter, if I compare on that scale, is like 10 power 11 gram. That means 100, 10 power 6 is a million, 10 power 9 is a billion. So this is 100 billion gram per centimeter cube. So if I were to make, or if somehow the nature were to make a coin of a nuclear matter of the size of this gold coin, this would weigh about a hundred kiloton. A 10 gram gold coin, which will be just about a centimeter radius or so, and a nuclear matter would weigh about a hundred kiloton. Neutron stars are the stars which are made of nuclear, basically neutrons, so they are like made of nuclear matter. But typically, a neutron star has a 20 kilometer radius. That means this is just about uh, um, half the distance between the Kolaba to the Mumbai airport. That's like a 35 kilometer, so this will be about half. And the mass of a neutron star is one and a half times that of the mass of the sun. And the radius of the sun, if some of you may know, is like in 700,000 kilometer. So this again gives you an idea of how much of the mass, how much of the weight is concentrated in the nucleus. So what do we see if we peep inside an atom? So inside an atom, we have nucleus, as we talked about, the nucleus consists of neutrons and protons. Neutrons do not have charge, protons have a positive charge. This cartoon is not to the scale, just showing you very schematically, but we will come back to this later. What I want you to notice here is that the mass of the neutron is slightly larger than the mass of the proton. The nuclear physicists and the particle physicists measure the mass in the strange units of the energy. This is given by Einstein's uh, principle of equivalence of energy and mass. So typically a mass of proton or a neutron is close to a thousand MeV. It is 900 something odd, so it's close to thousand MeV. So it is close to a one giga electron volt. EV is an electron volt. The energy of an electron moving inside a hydrogen atom is of the order of 13 electron volt. 
in that in there if i want to take out an electron from the uh, from an atom i would have to give out typically a few electron volt so this is just to give you a scale uh, i understand somebody has raised a hand uh, do i take questions now or i take questions at the end of uh, lecture satya we will take the questions at the end so okay fine i have already written on this side yeah, sorry okay okay Thanks. so please uh, uh, keep your questions to the end please yeah yeah sorry about that the mass of the electron is only about half a mega electron volt so the compared to the proton and neutron electron is very very light so the nucleus consists of protons and neutrons and it's very strongly bound because typically as we know from our normal electrostatics that if i have two protons or two electrons two like charge will repel so here there is something which is being several protons together starting from light atoms like hydrogen helium when we go to heavier atoms like lead uranium almost close to 100 protons are kept together so there is a very there is a different something else in the nature called a strong force which keeps them together when they come very close to each other but what is interesting to note is that not all combinations of protons and neutrons are stable because we have new we have several nuclei like we have hydrogen you have helium helium has helium nucleus has two protons two neutrons if i move on to oxygen i will have eight protons eight neutrons but i don't have eight protons and 20 neutrons that will become oxygen 28 that's not stable you can these days make some of these unstable nuclei but that's a different issue now if you come to the the discovery of or the uh, puzzle of the beta decay or at least it was called because it took people when the discoveries were made to identify that beta decays are electrons and so on so here now if we go back to this point look at it the neutron is slightly heavier than the proton so a free neutron can actually decay into a proton and an electron and something that something question mark i will come to and uh, it because uh, whatever is the mass difference like the chemical reactions the differences in the masses is given out as an energy the uh, the when something decays in the radioactivity or in the uh, in the technical term we measure its decay rate or we characterize it by a time scale called a half life that means if i had 100 neutrons in about 10 minutes which is its half life about half the neutrons would decay this is probabilistic so it's not exact but that gives you a measure of how long the particle or or system can survive so what was expected was that if the neutron was decaying into proton and electron because in case of a beta decay the electron was seen to emerge from the nucleus one expected that it will have the unique energy which is energy to be released as a mass difference but what was measured it is shown here in this slide as a bismuth uh, 210 nucleus decay was that the electrons came out with all kinds of energies which was called a continuum spectrum that it had a continuous distribution so this was very puzzling and finally an explanation to this to understand was given by pauli this is uh, pauli who uh, came up with this as a this, uh, as a desperate measure because i by then also we knew and we know that for most of the processes around us in nature the energy is conserved there are certain basic quantities which are conserved that energy is among one of them then there are things like momentum charge and some other uh, numbers that we will not worry about right so pauli introduced a, a concept of a small neutral particle and in italian uh, italian this is called small you know means small that's where it came a concept was called neutrino and he said that in this decay along with electron something else is emitted which is an invisible particle which is for invisible to us we are not able to detect it and that is what is carrying away part of the energy that's where you see a continuum spectrum because the energy is conserved between or shared between electron and neutron so that was the birth of neutron now just a moment to take about uh, to tell you about importance of radioactivity many of us these days or there is an apprehension about whether it's something very bad and it is always a dangerous thing and so on but i think we should realize that radioactivity is in the interior of earth is one of the sources that's responsible for heat generation 
because the inside the uh, at the core of the earth there are many nuclei which are undergoing radioactivity and the heat is generated by these particles so this high temperatures actually results in the uh, causes ionization and give the motion of these ions in this ionization uh, gives you the earth's magnetic field and this geomagnetic field deflects solar wind protecting earth's atmosphere without which there would be no life on earth so we would not exist if there was no radioactivity so radioactivity is not all that bad that just uh, keep you that in mind so before we go on further with neutrinos just also take a moment to understand that nucleus as a tool is also has a very wide applications in our daily life as i said energy production the energy release is large when there is a fission or a nuclear reaction uh, reaction the energy scales are mega electron volt in chemical reaction the energy scales are electron volt so these are million times larger than electron and chemical processes it has applications in life sciences medicine for the di cancer diagnostics treatment and there are also now it is medical cyclotrons in our country also for the production of medical isotopes and even the heavy ions heavy nuclei are used for irradiations of cancer tumors and radiation therapy so let's come back now to our main topic of the looking for neutrinos so today as we understand the constituents of the nucleon protons and neutron are also made of the basic uh, some more smaller particles basic particles called as quarks they come in certain pairs and there are six quarks up down charm strange top and bottom and the correspondingly other family of particle or their cousins called leptons so we have electrons and its neutrino electron neutrino there are cousins of uh, uh, electrons like muons and tau uh, leptons and they have their corresponding neutrinos these various particles quarks and leptons they interact among themselves by different forces Uh, the strong forces which i told you which is responsible for keeping protons together in the nucleus the weak forces which causes the beta decay conversion of a neutron to a proton as an example of that electromagnetic forces which are photons and the the, the gluons which are all the uh, related to the strong forces so these make up these various particles which are the called the force carriers or the mediators of the force carriers. many of you would have recently heard a few years back the discovery of higgs boson which is also a major part major uh, constituent of this whole standard model of the uh, particle physics of, as a, as we understand and these various all these things put together make the uh, standard model now while we have understood about many of these constituents through various different uh, studies the neutrinos have been the most puzzling and we know very little about the neutrinos so what if we uh, to understand that we look at something a little more about the nature the nature also likes to take out the particles in pairs so we have electron positron i told you there are quark so u u bar quark proton anti proton and so on so each particle has its corresponding anti particle so what are the antiparticles they have same mass but opposite electrical charge and again if we go back because of then i talked about charge conservation and other conservation principles from the vacuum or from nothing when we want to create a particle we have to create a particle and antiparticle pair so if we now think of the universe when it began with a big bang there was nothing so there would have been particles created and there would have been antiparticles created but we are all made of particles so where did all those anti particles go why do we see more matter other than the anti matter because when there are anti particles there should be anti matter and there was the, this is just a uh, picture of an uh, experiment at cern which has been producing uh, uh, and trying to create anti matter and study it so interested people can look up uh, at, at that point so now we can continue with this basic knowledge about the particles anti particles and some things about standard model we come back to the story of neutrinos so as i told you in the beginning this uh, some time back to conserve the momentum and energy in the nuclear beta decay process pauli suggested a massless that means a zero mass or a very light neutral particle and uh, he said that it shares the energy between electron but it is difficult to detect so that happened in 
Fermi, another famous uh, scientist, built on this uh, theory further and gave a complete theory for or explained this beta decay of neutron going into proton and electron. And he assumed that this neutrino, which comes out, is like an electron, is a spin half particle. Now, spin is a concept for, a, for the, uh, I would just like to explain, it's like an earth spins itself, we call it. So spin is also the, is a kind of an intrinsic angular momentum, intrinsic rotational motion um, assigned to the individual particles. Of course, one should bear in mind that these particles being very tiny, actually follow what is called as the quantum mechanics. So when we are talking of some of this concept or I'm taking an analogy, it is more for just for an uh, sort of making a classical uh, uh, argument or classical picturization for understanding and it should not be taken to the extreme. So, but it has uh, given the fact that neutrino while escaping detection, it was first actually detected in 1956. It took more than 20 years after uh, its uh, postulation to have actually a direct detection. And this was done by Reins and Kova. So what did they do? They actually did not detect a neutrino, they detected an antineutrino. An antineutrino is the antiparticle of the neutrino. So in the, react, in the nuclear reactor where a lot of fission and beta decay happens, in the beta decay, the antineutrinos are uh, emitted. And they looked at this stream of antineutrinos and they made it react with proton and which will finally go into neutron and a positron. So this is an inverse of a beta decay. And then this positron, because these antiparticles actually decay very fast, as soon as they meet any no normal particle or their pair, they would uh, just pair with their corresponding uh, particle and then they go into two gammas. So the Nobel Prize for this was awarded in 1995 and only one of them could get it because the uh, other guy unfortunately had passed away. So this is the schematic of the experiment that you had a flux of antineutrinos coming from a nuclear power plant and it, uh, they made a large tank of the uh, water with cadmium chloride salt and the uh, antineutrinos reacted with cadmium and generated, uh, 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 sorry, generate in, in the reacted with proton and then generated the, uh, uh, gave you positron, then this positron further gave you two gammas. And one of the new, the neutron which got created reacted with cadmium, which also further uh, had a metastable state, so could be detected. So all these photons which were coming out, finally in this, uh, this detector, which, which is actually cadmium also served as scintillator, so this was coupled, I was detected. So it was one of the large scale experiments. So its water tank consisted about 400 liters of water in this one. So you can so work out your typical bath bucket is like a 20 liter. So you can work out what will be the size of this detector. And keep this in mind because we are going to see the size of detectors growing further. The, uh, while this was going on, something more came to light about neutrino, like Kahani may twist. So as we know, the, um, if I stand in front of a mirror, I see my mirror reflection, but my right hand doesn't look the same as of my mirror image right and my right hand is not same. So this, is the, uh, this mirror uh, image uh, effect in the physics jargon is called the parity. So, so far, like I told you, there are basic conserved quantities like energy and momentum in the, and the charge, the parity or the, uh, the uh, action under the mirror reflection is also a very uh, generally a conserved quantity in physics. So, but what was observed was when uh, uh, people were studying this weak interaction, that it was conjectured that does it really also follow this symmetry or not? So, Madame Wu in uh, 1956 did a very, very clever and a very smart experiment. Again, I would urge all of you to go and read about it because this is one of the very fundamental experiments where by studying the beta decay from cobalt 60, she actually showed that the uh, uh, neutrinos and the, the weak interaction involving neutrinos does not conserve the parity. Now, this was really something, this is the first observation of the parity variation. So now we know something about neutrinos that they are very tiny. 
we don't know what, the, what their mass is. They are, uh, uh, they exist, at least by mid 50s, they were detected. So they also exist and they do not, uh, the, the interactions involving neutrinos leads to parity violation in some cells. Now, today, where if we look around, where do the neutrinos come from? So the neutrinos have been there right from the beginning of the universe. So those are called the neutrinos from Big Bang. And right after one minute after Big Bang, they have become separate. And because they have so little interaction with the matter around it, they keep coming even today to us, and they are the messengers from that era, from the uh, uh, time from the universe began. The neutrinos come to us from the sun because sun is generating its energy through nuclear reaction, and I'll talk more about it later. But so the typical energy of the neutrinos coming from these different processes is also different, and I try to put down some numbers. So the neutrinos from the Big Bang are very, very low energy. They are, have energy a fraction of an electron volt. The neutrinos coming from the sun would be about 0.1, that is one tenth of an electron volt to about 20 mega electron volt. In the universe, when the stars explode, again, the binding energy gets released uh, 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 when a neutron star is born, that is emitted in terms of neutrinos. And these are relatively higher energy neutrinos, about 10 to 13. So the neutrinos, as I told you again, I highlight the messengers from the farthest parts of the universe. We also have atmospheric neutrinos coming from the cosmic rays and the reactions and their uh, decays. These can be very, very high energy neutrinos. So they will go to, and uh, uh, you can see 10 power 19 EV and so on. The, uh, I mentioned the radioactivity at the core of the Earth. These neutrinos so that also generates neutrinos, and since they don't interact, they will still keep coming out of the Earth when they're coming. In addition, you have neutrinos from man made activities, like coming from reactors and particle accelerators. But these, again, will be related to nuclear fission. So there are few MeV neutrinos. But the reactor neutrinos, you can get a very, very large flux of neutrinos for making their studies. And uh, as I just mentioned earlier, this was the one which led to the discovery of the antimatter. So now, are you bumping into neutrino? Yes, very much. Every second, your body receives about 400,000 billion neutrinos from the sun. You have 50 billion neutrinos from natural radioactivity from the Earth. So again, you can see ridiculously large numbers here, from 10 to 100 billion neutrinos from nuclear plants all over the world. So typically, a neutrino has to zip through millions and millions and millions of people before doing anything. So that has worked out there. But I would also point out an interesting fact to you that our body contains about 20 milligrams of forty potassium which is radioactive. So we, each one of us, is emitting about 340 million neutrinos per day, traveling nearly at the speed of light. So ever in life, if you feel depressed or if somebody gets depressed, you can tell them you, each one of us is a scintillating personality. We should never feel depressed. So what we need to know is that how many types of neutrinos exist? In the, uh, remember the picture I showed you about the standard model, I said there's the electron, muon, and tau. So each of one of them should have a corresponding neutrino, and there may be uh, more which we want to look at. We know that neutrino mass is small, but is it zero or is it non-zero? That is a very, very important question. Now we also said that particles and antiparticles are different because they have opposite charge. So if you take a photon which has no charge, it's its own, its own antiparticle. So neutrino being a neutral, can it be its own antiparticle? And then, as I told you also, if you recall, why there is more matter than antimatter in the universe? So can neutrinos help us understand this last question? So these are the open questions. And uh, I mean, some of these are open questions. So let us see at least uh, one question is answered from this list. So let us see now what we know about. So let me go back to the solar uh, neutrino or this, uh, the production of neutrinos in the sun. The, uh, uh, this, the sun has, is mainly made of hydrogen. It's very hot, so the two proton atoms can come together and fuse to generate. And there is some various multiple series of steps which happens, but just forget that. But what you need to remember is that the four hydrogen atoms, that's the four hydrogen nuclei, four protons, 
weigh more than the helium. So that's where finally, after a lot of steps, when four protons come together to make a helium nucleus, it emits a lot of energy and it emits neutrinos. So since these reactions were known, the composition of the sun was known, people made predictions on how many neutrinos one should receive from the sun. And obviously, once you have such a, uh, uh, such a projection made, we want to go and measure, make an experiment to detect how many uh, and count the neutrinos coming from the sun. But since we have abundant cosmic rays everywhere around us, if I want to look for these weakly interacting particles like a neutrino, which is uh, uh, very, very difficult to detect, we need to hide or, or go away from the cosmic ray. This is like if I want to listen to a good music and if there is a lot of uh, noise around it, I need to either turn on my headphone or go into a room and shut off all the doors and, the listen, and go to a quieter so, thing so that you reduce the noise. You know, all the experiments mentalists like this term, reducing the noise. And it is very, very similar to reducing the noise of the crowd. Of course, uh, in the currently right now in the COVID-19 uh, lockdown situation, all the noises uh, have reduced considerably, but neutrinos continue. So what one does to get the uh, shield from the cosmic ray is you go either in the inside a mountain or in the mine. Because the, the intensities of the cosmic ray muons, as I've shown here, drops drastically as you go down. What is plotted here in the x-axis is the depth which you go down to. And this depth, when they call water equivalent, is defined as the rock density uh, uh, multiplied that uh, multiplied. So the depth in meters multiplied by the rock density. So it's like as if I had this much of thick water cover to kill the uh, thick. So typically, if you know uh, here, if you see a point here called KGF, this was the actually in six uh, experiments, underground experiments started in India. And it was running till uh, late 80s. And uh, today's meeting coordinator, Satya, actually has been associated with this experiment. So maybe sometime during this series, he will tell you some stories about it. This was one of the deepest uh, gold mine experiment. And the first discovery of the atmospheric neutrino came from an experiment down here. So, so in 1968, the first underground experiment took place in Homestead Gold Mine in the US where Raymond Davis tried to measure the um, uh, neutrinos coming from the sun. And here I show you a summary. Don't worry about the complication of the graph, but basic idea was that he actually tried to measure and he found much smaller number of neutrinos than he expected. Now what happens when you do something, somebody comes and tells you that if somebody gives you a problem to solve and you say the answer is smaller, the first thing your teacher will tell you is that go back and redo it. So here people try to do different types of experiments, but the story remained the same. These tall curves are showing you different theories, looking at because different detectors try to look at different aspects. And then the experiment every time returned a smaller answer. Then the, the theoreticians got thinking and then said, okay, what could be happening? So is that somehow the sun is producing the neutrinos, but they get they change, they become different. So let me give you a very, very um, simple classical analogy for that. Let's say that today a, uh, there's a museum, a science museum, and a group of school kids is entering the museum to see. Now, given the current COVID-19 situation, and even when the situation is, as we need to be protective. So when you enter, at the entry point, you're given the, the kids are given the mask to wear. So they, when they, uh, the first group of, say, 20 kids is given a mask which is uh, red in color, and next group is given blue in color. After a while, when the guards look around and they start counting the kids by mask, because that's how they will look at a group, they find that there are less than 20 red and more blue. And then they wonder what happens. So again, go back, do the same thing. Go back, repeat the experiment. You count again. Then they know, probably think that some of the kids, actually the masks are reversible, so that some of the kids are changing the mask or exchanging the mask. Both can happen. If the masks are reversible, they change the color or they can change. So then the guards want to be a little uh, strict with the kids, but they know the kids will do that. So they give them an, uh, a suggestion that, okay, 
If you want to change a mask, you can do it only when you are changing the floor. You are going from first floor to second floor and so on. So now what will happen? Even if you started with 20, 20 equal, some will change from red to blue when they change, go to the first floor. Some will change back to red when they go to second floor and so on. So this is what actually the neutrinos do. Also, you know, uh, so the, you know, I mean, this is a very naive way of putting it, but that's what they do. So they start off as electron neutrino, but some of them change on the way, to depending on how long they travel or how much energy they have, they will change to muon neutrinos or the muon neutrinos will change to electron neutrinos and so on. And that's why then when we look at electron neutrinos, we find something missing because these electron neutrinos have become muon or some other or tau neutrinos or something else. So how do we do uh, take care of that? Simple solution, you have to count all types of neutrinos when they come. And how do we do that? So I just, I'm not going to give you the details of an experiment, but here I want to now tell you, give you an idea of the scale of an experiment. That's where we are. Talking. Remember the first experiment which I told you about, that was about 400 liters. Now from there we come to this one of the uh, uh, major experiments, which was done in uh, Sudbury uh, Neutron Observatory in Canada. Here, this is a small human being standing here and that this is the scale of the experiment. So this contains 1,000 tons of spatial heavy water, which is a deuteron, deuteron is a heavy hydrogen, which is a D2O, hydrogen has only one proton, deuteron has one proton, one neutron. This is just the central part. Then it is surrounded by 1,700 tons of uh, normal water, which is further sur surrounded by 5,300 tons of uh, water which acts as outer sheet. So that's the scale from 400 liters. Now we have come here and this tells you that we are, this experiment was done about two kilometer underground. And now what happens? Uh, uh, okay, sorry, before I tell you what happens, there's another experiment which was done in Japan, which was called Super Cameo Kande. So here, this is again, this is a 40 meter height and diameter sphere. This contains 50,000 tons of uh, ultra pure water and this tells this shows this picture shows you how these are not people who have gone for the uh, vacation these guys are actually servicing the detector sitting in a boat which is inside this huge water tank this is available on the net you can see more things more details about it and when they do this experiment and look at different types of neutrinos and count all we actually find that the puzzle is solved so now the sun is producing within the measurement error and theory can also be fine-tuned a little bit as the neutrinos, which as expected. So this grew conclusively proved and then Nobel Prize came as you have seen on some of the slides that the neutrinos oscillate. They go from one type into other type. Now this can happen, which is beyond the scope of this lecture to explain that the theory, but I'll tell you this can happen if neutrinos have mass. So neutrino oscillations confirm that neutrino has a very small mass, but it's not zero. So uh, these people got Nobel Prize in uh, 2015 for this. Now we come back to another question that whether neutrino is its own antiparticle or not. Now here again, it's like people have uh, debates. There we have two great scientists, Dirac and Meorana. Both of them have given you a different conjecture. The Dirac said that neutrino may be a zero uh, charge particle, but it has a definite spin. It's a left-handed spin, like a left-handed screw, and anti-neutrino is right-handed, so neutrino and anti-neutrinos are not same. Whereas Meirana prayer said that neutrinos and anti-neutrinos are same. And this is the puzzle which is still unsolved. And this is the puzzle which we are trying to solve by look, is looking for neutrino less double beta decay. And in the next few minutes, I'll try to tell you more about it. So now we, we learned about neutrino from the beta decay. So now when we want to learn, study about nature of neutrino, we want to go a little further than the beta decay. So we go to what is called a double beta decay. Maria Gopart Mayer was a nuclear physicist and she actually got a Nobel Prize in nuclear physics for describing the shell model of nucleus, basically 
something like an atomic shell, the nucleus also has shells and the structure or the special properties of some uh, magic nuclei, what we call magic number, like field shells, inert gases, the nuclei also have special numbers. So she got Nobel Prize for that. So she also predicted that in some cases, the nuclei would undergo a double beta decay. If this is a bit technical, forget about this. I will uh, try to explain to you simply that when we uh, a free neutron decays into proton and electron, that is beta decay. But this most of the times when you talk of nuclear beta decay, this neutron to proton conversion is happening inside the nucleus. So now it can one it can happen when a nucleus can go from a higher step to a lower step, that is a higher energy to the lower energy step. Consider that you are rolling a ball in a staircase. If the ball will go down and stay on the bottommost stair. In the similar way, the nucleus would beta decay and go to the next nucleus if, there is, if it is energetically lower state. So in some nuclei, a beta decay cannot take you down because that beta decay nucleus will sit at a higher energy point. Then it cannot go there. Then, but if two neutrons decide that they will beta, simultaneously beta, uh, undergo a beta decay and go into proton, then it can go down to a lower state. So that's the process of the double beta decay. Now, in some cases, it's not energy, but also spin forbidden, but we'll leave that out. Right? Now, then it was predicted that if such a process happens, double beta decay, then and neutrino is its own antiparticle, then as two neutrinos or two antineutrinos are coming out, they should pair up, annihilate, and I should finally see only two electrons giving rise to a phenomena called neutrino-less beta, double beta decay. And this is what is will therefore, if you observe such a phenomena, this would be the signature of the, uh, uh, to tell you the nature of neutrino, whether it's a Majorana or a Dirac particle. So if we observe neutrino-less double beta decay, it will be a Majorana particle. Now let us see the time scales of these processes. A beta decay, typically goes on up to I mean, a few minutes if the lifetimes range from few minutes, but it's like a 10 for 10 years because it's a week, that's where the sun is living uh, that long. Otherwise, it would have all burnt up and we would not exist. A double beta decay is a doubly weak process. We've got two neutrons together have to decay. So that goes on like 10 for 20 years. And neutrinoless double beta decay is even rarer than double beta decay and its half-life is like a 10 power 24 years. So this is a very, very rare process. But I think many of you will know what is the lifetime like of the universe is like a few billion years. So this is much longer than that. So how do we search for it? So I'm going to skip through some of the slides because I want to come back uh, to give you some flavor of the experiment. And I will take about three to four more minutes. So uh, just now to uh, recapitulate the importance of neutrino less double beta decay, this is the only experiment to test the true nature of neutrino, whether it's a Dirac or Majorana particle. Further, it enables the measurement of the neutrino mass, which is there that it will tell you what exactly the mass is. There. So this is the neutrino physics is the gateway to physics beyond standard model. The picture, nice picture of the particles which we put in and we thought we understood everything. And we feel therefore that it also has implication for asymmetry of matter over antimony. This is a very highly interdisciplinary subject. It brings together all various branches of physics, nuclear physics, particle physics, astrophysics, cosmology, and techniques of many, many material science. And it has also a lot of engineering challenges for designing experiments. Because as I showed you some of the experiments, the, the, the scale of the experiments is very large. Now, this is an experiment to look for a neutrino less double beta decay in Germania. The experiment is called Gerda. It is located in the Gran Sasso laboratory of uh, uh, Italy, uh, and this is a human being, and this is the size of a detector again. This detector has become part one of the detector has become operational in 2013, and they do not see any uh, evidence of neutrinless double beta decay as yet. I want to draw your attention to a one uh, factor here, the background. Because you're looking for a very rare events, you have to keep the noise the background very low. And here, just remember this number to be like a 0 0.02 counts per kV kilo electron volt. That's your energy window. 
per kilogram of detector per one year of counting. It is this small. You have to make noise that low to be able to see your signal of your interest. And you have to have a very good energy resolution of a detector to may be able to measure this sharply. This is another uh, detector which is running in uh, same Grand Sasso laboratory called uh, Kore. This is the uh, calorimetric detector and what I, we are going to do and I'll talk about it has very similarity to this. So this is again, you can see a very large scale of the detector has a lot of close to a, uh, one ton mass. And again, the backgrounds are very, very small, which you look for. So what we want to do in India, and I think it's, you will realize that it's important that we have the IMO project and we will be able to build such a detector to do such a fantastic uh, physics uh, study. So we want to make a detector in 124 pin. This is one of the few uh, candidates which can undergo the beta decay. It has a Q value of 2, point, uh, 2,291 kV or 2.2 MeV. And uh, this is a cryogenic detector. So what is a detector concept? The detector is, is a basically a calorimeter detector. Many of you would have done a school experiment or would have seen an experiment that you have a copper beaker in which you have uh, ice or you keep normal water and you add the ice and there's a temperature change. So in the similarly, if I put a cold water and I add some hot liquid to it, the uh, temperature will change. Now, if I measure the temperature rise, I would know how much energy I put it in. So that's a simple concept. Only thing is to be able to now detect these two mega electron volt electron uh, uh, energy electrons, I need to keep my detector or the beaker in my so-called beaker in my experiment at a very, very low temperature. It is kept at 10 millikelvin temperature. Do you know the room temperature is like 27 degrees Celsius, but in physics we measure that in Kelvin, so that's like a 300 Kelvin. So we have to go down to this uh, uh, millikelvin temperature. Most of the superconductors, if any of you would have heard of, are like at uh, superconducting at liquid helium temperature, which is like a copper. So I have some detector, then I need a thermometer, and I will have this low temperature bath. So that because this detector then will be kept at 10 millikelvin temperature and as and when the beta decay happens, these two electrons will deposit their energy in the generate energy and this generated energy will result in a pulse and I can now measure this pulse height or the temperature rise and therefore get the energy of the particles emitted. Very simply said, much difficult to do and uh, uh, I, I'm almost coming to the end. And uh, the first thing we need is now is the thermometer. So how do we measure this uh, uh, change in the temperature? So for that, in, we have started an uh, and, uh, effort and we have made this uh, indigenously developed this NTD, what is called neutron transmutation dope germanium sensors. So these are done in Dhruva reactor in DRC. You take the germanium and irradiate it with thermal neutrons. So it will capture the neutron, will produce nuclear reactions, will produce different isotopes of germanium, which will beta decay, giving you a finally a P-type doping. So now you get a very high do uh, do highly doped, uniformly doped germanium sensor, which is, not, which is now you can adjust its uh, uh, total resistivity, and it will have a resistance which is strongly dependent on the temperature. So it's like, you know, you measure mercury used to, uh, at least we used to use a mercury thermometer for measuring body temperature because the mercury will expand. So here the rise in temperature will change the resistance and this change in resistance, now then you deduct the change in temperature and hence the energy of the particle because if we know the uh, heat capacity. This will skip, but we go down to millikelvin temperature and this is the setup which we have in the laboratory which generates uh, we can achieve 10 millikelvin temperature here and uh, uh, this has uh, been operational now for a few years. These are our, uh, shows you different parts of the setup of the diagnostic thermometry because you also have to measure that the, uh, this fridge or what do you call the refrigerator or commonly called as a uh, dilution refrigerator but commonly called as a fridge behaves is that you need to actually because it's a 10 millikelvin you have to shield it from 300k so that all that itself is all uh, different uh, uh, details i can't go into it right now 
but you need to monitor that. So this is all the diagnostic uh, setup and the various thermometry measurement things which we have set up. This is how we make our sensors from the anti-germanium anterior germanium which have come in. You polish, you have the masks, you do a lithography, you make the sensors, you have to make contacts and you finally mount them for doing the thing. And this is some of the characterization data of the sensor. Finally, you make the, use the sensor to make a bolometer. And this is, we have first tried to show you some examples of sapphire and tin bolometers. And this is how the pulses will look like. And this is how we can generate the spectrum. And we still need to improve the spectrum, but we are getting there. When we do these measurements, well, we have to keep the noise level, the background very, very low. So we also do what is called the low uh, background uh, studies using the germanium detectors. This is a, the detector which is shielded with copper and Roman lead. This lead is recovered from Roman ships which were sunk uh, uh, almost 4,000 years ago. And so that is devoid of any intrinsic radioactivity in the lead. And so we have made this setup and we can look for very small traces of radioactive elements in the materials because all these materials which we use have to be radio pure. Otherwise, they will give the background. So we need to qualify the materials. We develop new detectors. So we have to also, like there is a proposal to do a dark matter experiment at INO. So they are developing some detectors. So these detectors also are tested in this setup to qualify whether they are radio pure and we can use them or not. This is just to show you uh, the typical gamma ray spectrum. Don't worry about the details, but look at the change from red to the black. This is how we get an improvement in the noise. This is like, you know, you will see your uh, music systems will show you the noise spectrums which are going down. So we see several orders of improvements which comes down. We also look, do the studies of neutrons produced by the cosmic ray muons which are abundant. And these neutrons further make reaction and give us the background. So we look at the, uh, do all these various aspects of the study. So let me just summarize now that I hope I have conveyed to you what can neutrinos tell us. The neutrino mass, we have to measure that once it's non-zero, it needs a revision in our current understanding of uh, 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 standard model. Now, let, uh, I, I think this is what the nature does. I mean, we thought we, we have understood all the diseases and we have cures for everything and it throws COVID-19 at us. Similarly, like when we, have, uh, we, are, we thought we understood everything about basic particles, the neutrinos opened up the newer dimensions. Neutrinos are the messengers from farthest parts of the universe, so they bring us the information about the early universe as well. We, want, we, would, we hope to understand through this uh, neutrinos that why there is more matter than antimatter in the universe. There are also the geoneutrinos, which will give you information on interior structure of the Earth. And the neutrinos, the, the type of neutrinos, there are conjectures that there are sterile neutrinos, which do not couple to electron, muon, and uh, uh, tau neutrinos. So therefore, they are, don't interact in the, in the range of these particles. So they are called sterile neutrinos. These are candidates for the dark matter. So I will conclude by showing you our group because the, some of the works which I showed you are actually all the work done by these people. And I hope some of them are listening so they can see themselves on the Zoom and YouTube. Uh, so I would like to thank INO Collaboration and Tintin Collaboration for all the help they have given us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Vandana, for a very, very beautiful uh, talk, comprehensive in the sense all the way starting from basic nuclear physics, uh, passing on to the neutrino physics, the problems, the oscillations, and uh, the various aspects coming on to the uh, neutrino as double beta decay, what it is about, what is the importance of uh, the absolute mass of the neutrinos, uh, and so on, and coming on to developing your own efforts uh, in developing these uh, very, very sensitive entities, uh, sensors, which are going to be used uh, in these experiments in TIFR and in the INO cavern. And uh, finally, also uh, ending up with seeing what are the possible uh, problems that are going to be tackled by these very, very sensitive detectors. And very happy to see your all smiling, nice young group, uh, whom you said are uh, you know in the labs working hard to uh, get all this happening. And I hope it will inspire many people on the, on the call today to take up uh, careers in nuclear and high energy physics experiments and uh, the challenge uh, that you have been talking to. So we also uh, quite, uh, it's quite nice that you also brought up a lot of parallels to uh, 
the situations right now and you know how things get connected to science and so on and uh, that's indeed true that, uh, you know in science when you say you discover something and uh, close the window uh, probably uh, an opportunity of doors get opened up for younger generations so and uh, let me just tell you before you go for they are all smiling because i was not in the lab <laughs> that's a nice one boss is not there <laughs> so, <laughs> so very nice so uh, as i uh, to now uh, to all the participants as uh, we have mentioned in the beginning of the talk now the talk is actually open for uh, your questions uh, what i would like to request you is please uh, whoever has uh, raise your hand i'm going to unmute uh, one at a time and then uh, you can ask question directly to the speaker and she will answer and then we'll go to the next one so that we can have the question answers more in more orderly fashion right okay so now please uh, raise your uh, hand now i see uh, one bala subramaniam i'm going to unmute uh, hi good evening yeah. hello yeah, yeah. yeah we can uh, hear you okay hi ma'am uh, thanks for the nice talk i have two questions one is about the director uh, shape so in your slide you showed uh, the sno detector and super k detector looked like a spherical uh, shape uh, uh, whereas for the I, our ino detector is going to be in the cuboid shape so does it have any i mean uh, specific reason yeah the uh, see the uh, uh, cameo kande is uh, the detector when you are view, viewing something and the uh, snow detector has the, uh, had a vessel which was spherical so when you have a large pressure or the large vacuum the spherical shapes are preferred because of the uniform forces and the viewing angle the ino detector is having a magnet and then you have to have the iron plate so then you have to consider what are the detector components and how you fabricate it for example the other detectors which i showed you for the double beta decay which were there those are more like a cylindrical base with uh, even detectors the germanium detectors are cylindrical and uh, the uh, core detector or the tin detector will be also the cubes which are arranged in the strings so it actually the shape of the detector is, uh, there is uh, both the your detection principle I, uh, but because they are large size the engineering aspects come into it much more uh, strong okay uh, another question it's not the technical one so is the na naming of the india based neutrino observatory the last the acronym is ino mm. it, it's a part of the word neutrino is it is it chosen just because of that reason or i mean it's just a coincidence coincidence no word? we want to look for neutrino that is why it was given as india as neutrino observatory <laughs> it's not a coincidence it's a part of it. okay ma'am yeah thank you ma'am okay uh, so we go to the next question by shailesh i am going to unmute yeah please go ahead yeah i have two questions so yeah, yeah please go ahead first one is uh, is there a particular reason the uh, double beta decay experiment is situated with the uh, ical detector maybe because of the already background reduction is going to take place place for that neutrino oscillation experiment yes see the uh, all these experiments which you look for for example be it ical or the double beta decay or dark matter because the uh, at surface or overground level you are overwhelmed by the cosmic ray background so you need to shield that background which means you need to go either in a tunnel or in the mine now what depth you go to depends on the sensitivity which you want to achieve or which your physics uh, decides so but given the facts of making if we are making an underground observatory in the country then you need to uh, and if you need the, there are more experiments which need that it uh, logistically it becomes uh, imperative that you club such all such requirements and have it at one place but it's not mandatory suppose in a big country like india there were more than one underground laboratories were feasible or become feasible then the experiments can be housed in a different plot, uh, places but you will still draw a lot from each other particularly the dark matter static experiments have a lot in common and parallel so identities will be common you will draw from the strength you learn from each other a lot but here the, the when we when these are projected in the 
uh, same place, there are actually neighboring tunnels. It was the, that is how the laboratory is projected. If you have multiple, many of these underground laboratories have multiple tunnels, and then you house different experiments. But yes, because you have to get, you do an effort to reduce the background, you maximize the usage of it. And my second question is that uh, the SN 124 is not just a neutrino less double beta decay source, but it is a double beta decay source. So yes. it will emit a lot of neutrinos. Yes. Won't that be an additional background for the ICAL detector, which is trying to detect neutrino oscillations? Okay, a very, very good question. Because all the candidates which do neutrino less double beta decay have double beta decay also possible, normal double beta decay. So that means it will emit neutrinos. But if you saw what the Q value of the of double beta decay reactions are in the few MeV, few mega electron volt. So that means the maximum energy those two neutrinos together take over, even when the electron will come out with zero energy, is equivalent to that Q. So that's like a 2.2 MeV. Whereas the ICAL is looking at the atmospheric neutrinos. So they are in a much higher energy rate. So this will not be a background. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Uh, and, and by the way, just one more thing. Even uh, our energy range is different, but even the uh, uh, double beta decay rate itself is so small that it will still be much smaller than the cosmic uh, 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 neutrinos which you are looking at. So both ways, it will not be an issue. Okay. Uh, are there any are there any other questions? Uh, uh, I have uh, one non-technical question uh, to the speaker. So we are, of course, uh, you have shown quite an interesting uh, experimental work, especially building detectors, characterizing them, and so on and so forth. Of course, besides the nuclear physics or the, uh, the physics that is undergoing. So uh, for example, for the students who are uh, at a level of MSc or sometimes even maybe very motivated students at a BSc level, uh, what kind of opportunity that your lab, uh, you know, uh, offers to them uh, for either short term or long term internships yeah. or future, uh, you know, career? Uh, yeah. for them? Okay, so I, I should have probably dwelt a bit on that, but I'm glad you asked that question. So. Uh, the MSc project students we take some time for the, uh, if they are there for doing this, uh, work with the NTD sensors, uh, as well as the background studies. And the uh, measurements which we do at even at millikelvin temperature, which is related directly related to the bolometer RND. So these are all very complex uh, uh, objects, but we have the smaller, uh, I mean, they are always can be small parts which are done. And we welcome all the uh, students uh, subject to the constraints of the available uh, uh, space and the other uh, uh, permissible permissions to the app in terms of total number of students we can accommodate. But students can do the summer project. The yeah, undergraduate students coming for the uh, for the short -term projects in the in the lab. So summer projects, short term projects, as well as the MSc semester long projects, which are there. And uh, of course, the um, PhD students from the collaboration and the uh, other participating institutions do come and spend a long time. But that's also an open thing, which is we would uh, be happy to take as many students as can. Of course, we can always take less than what we would like to, Minton, but we would, uh, interested people should definitely visit our website, which is there, and learn more about it and also get in touch with us. Okay. Uh, I saw some more hands. Raised. Yeah, we also now see one more question from Nishant Pawar. Uh, yeah, please go ahead and uh, ask your question. Hello. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, my question is regarding primordial neutrinos. Is Ionovi detecting primordial neutrinos or some regarding that? The uh, primordial means you're saying the, uh, the ones which were uh, remaining from the Big Bang. Yeah. Or Big Bang, so, yeah. So if Thank you recall my slide, let me just go back and show you that. See, they are very low energy. Yeah. You see that. Okay. So yeah. then that is the, so if you, that will not be therefore in the uh, scope of the I, 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 I can. But 
if the i know is there and tomorrow we want that there is another group of people come up with a clever another clever detector to look for this that would be possible to detect okay okay but i think the primordial neutrinos detecting on the earth it is uh, is difficult but as i said if some new clever things come up suppose even the solar neutrino problem something is there okay. you want to look at you can set it up there so once you have an observatory you can look at more yeah. okay okay thank you Okay. Uh, are there any more questions? So, the, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Hello. Hello. Oh, this is an expert uh, asking a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, no, sir. I don't know whether I have enough. This is uh, Professor <laughs> Pillay. No, no. I just wanted to answer the question which was asked previously. Oh, okay. There have been, there have been experiments uh, proposed, though not actually looked at the primordial nucleus, uh, primordial neutrinos. So, if you look at the Earth and the Sun, which is moving in the uh, in its orbits, okay, it is actually plowing through this background of neutrinos, which are uh, cold neutrinos so sit, sitting everywhere in space. So, so depending on the direction in which the Earth and the Sun are moving, you can actually. measure these neutrinos which will affect a if you have a gravitational detector so if yeah. you have a torsion balance detector yeah it's aligned with respect to the motion of the earth and the sun you will actually see sometimes it is getting pushed in one way or getting pushed in the opposite way and by looking at these differences when the earth is around the sun you can actually try to measure the effect of these uh, you can actually measure the number as well as the energy of the uh, primordial neutrino So this is one of the aims of some of these gravitational uh, uh, torsion balance. Torsion balance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no. So that's what I was saying. ICAL is not uh, will not do it. But if you want, we can work. Uh, maybe yeah. I mean we have to work out yeah. the so sensitivity for these things. But collision. it can be set yeah. up in the. Yeah. So the energy uh, transfer is by collision, not by a nuclear process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, thanks uh, actually for those of you if you it is very unlikely but in case you don't know uh, the person who spoke just now is professor rg pile who was at tfr till the other day of course he is an expert and is a uh, both experimentalist on uh, nuclear as well as the experiment that mandana talked about ndpd now he is uh, look uh, is a uh, is located in the iit roper of course continue to collaborate with the same experiment so that is professor pilek uh so are there any questions so i don't see any more uh so i would like to thank uh, professor mandana nanal uh, for giving this nice lecture today and uh, also i want to thank uh, professor pile professor rena professor vivek data and also all the participants uh, who are uh, who have actively participated in fact by your questions and otherwise uh before i end i just want to also uh, announce that uh, the next week we have three more talks as we had this week on fourth that is monday we are going to have a talk by uh, professor vivek dadar who is project director i know talking on demystifying the neutrino on 6th may which is wednesday we are going to hear amol dikhe from tfr mumbai going to talk on going underground to look at the sky and on 8th may that is friday we are going to talk uh, we are going to uh, listen to professor subhapati goswami from ahmedabad uh, talking on neutrinos the noble connection so this is the schedule for the next week so we invite all of you to to come back and enjoy these lectures next week as well uh, so if uh, vandana Uh, doesn't have any more anything else to yeah, yeah thank you thank yeah, you so uh, we thank once again everybody so take thank care you. stay safe and uh, let us see all of us all of you again on monday at 6 pm okay thank, thank you. you thank you thank you bye thank you bye bye